The NES Zapper, arguably the most successful aftermarket peripheral in video game history. Any child of the 80s that came in contact with the Nintendo Entertainment System very likely played Duck Hunt along with its ubiquitous light gun. It's been done. The Zapper grew upon decades of technology in order to provide you with the joy of shooting waterfowl, wild west outlaws, and innocent bystanders, all from the comfort of your own couch. So I think it's about time we took a few minutes to find out the way it worked. Light guns are a technology born in the days of yore, back, way back in the 1930s, which is when light sensing vacuum tubes were first developed. Yes, vacuum tubes, those relics of the pre-semiconductor era. The best thing since sliced cocoa out of vacuum tubes were large glass containers mostly devoid of air that performed switching, rectification, and the amplification of electricity. Everything that was anything used vacuum tubes, radios, computers, television. Yes, sir, these things were really the wasp nipples. So, light sensing, or photosensitive, vacuum tubes were able to convert light into electricity. It didn't take long before some enterprising individuals came up with the brilliant idea of mounting these tubes to moving targets and then creating fake rifles with light emitters built in. Basically, fancy gun-shaped flashlights. Thus, the light gun game was born. The very first was the Rayo light which was created by Seberg, a jukebox and orchestrion manufacturer, in 1936. Fast forward decades later, and arcades were still using this technology to great effect. Sauntering onto the scene was Nintendo, a fairly successful playing card manufacturer founded in the 19th century that broke into the electronic toy market in 1970 via technology from Sharp Electronics. One of the first electronic toys made by Nintendo was the Beam Gun, which worked much in the same way as its light gun predecessors. The Beam Gun, and Nintendo's shift to toys in general, was actually spearheaded by the future father of the Game Boy, Gunpei Yokoi. By 1973, Nintendo built on the success of the Beam Gun by opening a series of arcade ranges, which were actually remodeled bowling alleys that were set up with clay pigeons that contained light sensors. One year later, in 1974, Wild Gunman was released and became one of Nintendo's first arcade hits. Put your pistol in the holster and prepare to draw. Though in a different form than you may be used to. It used 16mm film to show gunmen popping up into an alley where the player had to either shoot them or be shot. Decidedly not like a baby's toy. By the 80s, Nintendo released their first hit home console, the Famicom, or NES, outside of Japan. A light gun accessory seemed a natural fit, though the idea of bringing this into the home was not new. In fact, the very first home console, the Magnavox Odyssey, also had a light rifle peripheral and one of the most badass looking ones at that. Compared to other light gun technologies of the 80s and 90s, which used fancy techniques like timing the scan lines of your television, the Zapper was relatively simple in its approach. It sensed light via a photodiode, the grandson of light sensing vacuum tubes from the 30s. Photodiodes are small semiconductor components that convert light into electricity and can be found in all sorts of gadgets today from night lights to remote control receivers, which specifically sense infrared light. Here's the Zapper's relatively simple process. When the trigger is pulled, it first sends a signal to the game to blacken the screen for one frame. The photodiode then activates to take a baseline dark reading and make sure it detects no light. If it does detect light, then it determines that the player is not pointing the zapper at the TV and no hits are recorded. This could be considered a sort of cheating failsafe to make sure that the player is actually aiming at the screen. If everything's kosher, it then moves on to target validation. White rectangles are drawn on the screen where valid targets are located, and the photodiode is activated again. This time, if it's pointed at the white rectangle on the screen, it registers a hit. This technique is repeated in order to differentiate between different targets on the same screen. For example, when there are two ducks on the screen in Duck Hunt, there are two different frames drawn, first one, then the other, that each correspond to a duck. For the first one, a white rectangle overlays it while the diode collects data on just that first duck. 
Then that will be blackened out and the next frame is drawn where the second duck's rectangle is placed on the screen and the diode collects data again. This is known as sequential targeting. All of this occurs within a couple frames of motion, where the frame rate of the North American NES was just over 60 frames per second, meaning that each frame took about 16 to 17 milliseconds. Your eyes will likely notice the quick blackening of the screen, but it's not really enough to interfere with the gameplay. So, as I said, simple. However, over the years there have been several myths perpetuated about the Zapper, its limitations, and how it works or doesn't work with modern technology. Myths that need to be, shall we say, bursted. First up, some people have claimed that when you use the Zapper with a cathode ray tube, or CRT, television, the prevailing TV technology of the 80s, you need to make sure that the screen is of the curved variety, as opposed to the more modern, flat screen CRTs. This may stem from the fact that curved CRTs were much more prevalent back in the 80s, therefore it's what the Zapper was meant to be played on. And there may be a grain of truth to that, however, this is simple to test. As you can see, my flat screen CRT television has no problem registering hits on the little duckies. Assuming my aim is true, of course. Therefore, myth bursted. Second myth, you can't use a zapper on modern HDTVs because they don't use scan lines. That is, instead of hurling electrons in a sweeping motion at the screen, which is what happens in a CRT, Plasmas, LCDs, and other HDTV tech simply illuminates all the pixels on the screen at once for each frame. Now, I can see where this line of thinking sprang up. Many game console light guns of the 80s and 90s, such as the Menacer for the Genesis and Super Scope for the Super Nintendo, did use a more complicated method involving timing of scan lines and whatnot. That's really too much to get into right now, so I'll save it for another episode. But the zapper simply looks at the screen whenever your trigger pull tells it to. After the cheating check screen, it either sees white, meaning hit, or black, meaning miss. No scan lines necessary. However, you may be calling me a lying nit right now because zappers don't work on HDTVs. Well, yes, I never said they did. I just said the reason wasn't because of CRT scan lines. Instead, I have a different theory. Let me tell you a tale of the horrible troll known as input lag. HDTVs, whether they be LCD, plasma, whatever, have a native resolution, unlike CRTs. That is, they have a fixed grid of pixels on the screen that show the sharpest image at a particular resolution. In order to display non-native resolutions, these TVs use devices called video scalers. For example, a display with a native resolution of 1280 by 960 that's given a signal of 640 by 480 must scale the width and height by 2 to display the image. Most HDTVs nowadays have a native resolution of at least 1280 by 720. The NES had a resolution of 256 by 240. Video scalers have to process the signal which introduces latency or delay. This delay can throw off the timing of the zapper by up to 70 or so milliseconds, according to some media tests. Remember, that baseline black screen is up for only one frame, or about 16 milliseconds. So when the zapper thinks it should be seeing the cheat detecting black screen at the beginning of a shot, it just sees a normal screen and registers no hit. Many televisions offer a game mode in which some of the signal processing responsible for most of the lag is sacrificed to decrease but not eliminate latency. However, several media outlets have run their own tests and though this helps for games like Rock Band, which is in HD and has its own workarounds built into the software anyway, it's not enough for the poor forgotten Zapper and the NES. Now, I can't say that this is the case for all HDTV game modes, since I don't own every modern HDTV to test this out. Yet. But, as far as the cause of the problem, I think we can pretty much say that the scanline myth is bursted. And lastly, the dreaded light bulb trick. There's been rumors circulating for years that one can cheat on certain games by pointing the zapper at a light bulb and just pulling the trigger, ensuring that the photodiode is always lit. As I noted, this would require the cheating mechanism, where the diode must first detect a black screen before acquiring targets, to not be present in a given game's code. Now, it's possible there are early versions of NES games where this is the case, but 
I've never seen it. Interestingly, this glitch would cause problems in games such as Hogan's Alley, where the gun would score hits on all valid targets as it quickly moved through them in sequence. Thus, you'd be unable to differentiate between good guys and bad guys, reducing the game to an instance of kill them all and let God sort them out. One could see how this would be a problem. But I have never seen this in action, nor has anyone I've talked to about it, nor have I seen any video showing it. I think it most likely that there were other light gun systems at the time that didn't have this baseline check, and therefore could be fooled by a simple light bulb. And perhaps people extrapolated this behavior unfairly to the zapper. It's a good chance that Nintendo had something kind of unique going on with the zapper's technology, since they did get a patent on it by the late 80s. Thus, I have to technically rate this myth as plausible but unsubstantiated since I haven't seen any dang proof that it ever really happened. If you have proof otherwise, please share it. I would love to see it, and I'm sure the gaming public would really like to know for sure if this worked or not. So that's the Zapper, a piece of gaming technology that's rather beautiful in its simplicity. Perhaps you've been inspired to dust off the one you undoubtedly have in your closet and play with it again. Just remember, CRTs only, please. It's not just nostalgia, it's science.